The Dragon and the Phoenix Throughout history and ancient lore, there have been two mythological creatures prevalent in every civilization throughout the world that have been worshipped and feared above them all. The Dragon and the Phoenix Two awe-inspiring glorious creatures in history, both majestic in stature and legendary for their mystical powers and attributes. Depending on your region of the world, say Middle Age Europe for instance, the dragon could be anything from a super terrifying relentless monster that wreaks havoc on towns and villages while killing men, eating children, and taking virgin women as sacrifices, to China, where it was and is the most magical and highly revered, respected, and worshipped creature in the world. Even Bruce Lee named himself after one. Peace to the guy, Bruce! Now on the other side, we have what is known as the Phoenix. Commonly associated with good or benevolent attributes, the Phoenix is a magnificent bird of the sun whose tears can heal wounds, like Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, which we'll be going over shortly, and whose feathers can raise the dead. The Phoenix is said to live for a period of 500 to 1500 years, after which it sets itself ablaze, dies, and a new phoenix rises from the ashes of its predecessor only to start the cycle all over again. No matter where you go in the world or what culture you come across, you'll find some version of a feathered serpent, good or bad, and a bird of the sun, both possessing great wisdom and or magical powers for the benefit or the destruction of the human race. But have you ever asked yourself, where do these myths and folklore come from? Were these creatures ever real? Are they based on any fact in history? If so, where do they go? And if not, what is the meaning of the symbolism that has allowed these creatures to exist throughout the cultures of the world for so many millennia? Now before we can answer those questions, I think we need to understand what myth and symbolism actually is. The etymology or root meaning of the word myth comes from the Greek mythos, which means speech, story, or anything told by word of mouth. The Oxford Dictionary of English Folklore defines myth as stories about divine beings generally arranged in a coherent system. They are revered as true and sacred and are endorsed by rulers and priests. In Joseph Campbell's book, The Inner Regions of Outer Space, Metaphor as Myth and as Religion, he states, Every myth, whether or not by intention, is psychologically symbolic. Its narrative and images are to be read, therefore, not literally but as metaphors. The root meaning of metaphor is to carry over or across. So in essence, a metaphor would be like a bridge or an idea that gets you across to the actual meaning. The etymology of symbol is to put or throw together. It's from the Greek symbolon, which means mark, ticket, or token. And its underlying meaning was to put different things together to represent a thought, word, or idea. Now being that we have no actual evidence that these magnificent creatures ever existed, one has to ask themselves, what is the true meaning and significance behind the myths and symbols that we have come to take for granted as part of our everyday society and culture? Do the legends of these mystical creatures have any basis in actual reality? And if so, what happened to them? It is these questions and more that this real Nagumentary will attempt to answer and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the dragon and the phoenix were and are the great melanated empires and civilizations of the ancient and modern world today. In order to unravel the mystery of the dragon and the phoenix, we first have to ask the questions. What is a dragon and what is a phoenix? How did they get their names? Where did they come from? And why were they so worshipped and revered throughout history? We will begin our journey of discovery with the dragon. The etymology of dragon is eye or clear sight. From the Greek drakin, to see clearly and the Sanskrit dark to see. To truly understand the dragon, we must first look at where this illustrious creature begins and its path through history. Since many of you may not be too familiar with actual dragon mythology or legends, let us sit back while the big homie Leonard Nimoy, aka Mr. Spock, takes us through the history and perception of dragons in the ancient world. Take it big homie. Dragons. Legendary beasts that thrash the skies and oceans into torrential storms. Monsters that spew fire, devour maidens, and battle knights. 
For thousands of years, dragons have haunted the human imagination. Dragons do abide in deep caves. Sometimes they come out of their holes and beating the air with their wings, they forsake the earth and fly aloft. Edward Topsell, 1658. If dragons are mere fantasy, why do dragon stories abound in ancient civilizations as far flung as Greece, Scandinavia, and China? What can explain sightings by the ancient Greek historian Herodotus? And mysterious reports by the explorer Marco Polo. It may be that dragons really did exist and they were so valuable, they were simply hunted to extinction. So valuable that they were hunted to extinction. As you may have noticed, the East and the West had different perceptions of the dragon. In the East, the dragon was revered as a god on which everything else was determined. The weather, your crops, your health, your spiritual character, and even the lineage of the emperor or the king. While in the West, it was feared as a monstrous demon or devil that terrorized the countryside, ate Christian men and children, and took Christian women as sacrifices or tribute. You also may have noticed that in most depictions of the dragon, they're either highly melanated or have some sort of hue with African facial features. As well, most of the demons accompanying any dragons were highly melanated, while all of their victims were non-melanated or Caucasian, not to mention all of the angels. This doesn't even fall into symbolism. It's pretty blatant. All of the devils, demons, and evil creatures throughout Caucasian history tend to be highly melanated or what most people believe is black today. Now we'll get into why I use the term melanated instead of black a little later in the video. Just know for now the word black actually means pale or yellow. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Looking back through history, it is plain to see that the dragon is the most feared and worshipped creature of all time. But if dragons are only fiction, mythology, and legend, and were never real, what possibly could the symbolism be behind this fearsome noble beast? What is the significance of the wings of the dragon, or feathered serpent, and why in the West do they only terrorize Christian or Caucasian men, women, and children? Now before we can answer those questions and many more, there's another legendary creature that requires our attention. A magical, benevolent bird of great majesty and renown called the Phoenix. Throughout history, the Phoenix has almost been worshipped on the same level as the dragon, but nowhere near as feared if at all. In fact, the Phoenix is quite the opposite. In every culture that carries the legend of the Phoenix, it has been sent here to help mankind against evil and his own destructive nature, which in most cases being one and the same. For those of you who are a little sketchy on the history and folklore of the phoenix, we will start with what else? The etymology or definition of phoenix. The definition of a phoenix is the mythical bird of Arabia, which flew to Egypt every 500 years to be reborn. The word phoenix comes from the Greek phoenix, which means Phoenician or purple, because the ancient Phoenicians used to make a purple dye from the sea snail known as murex. And this dye was so rare and expensive that 12 ounces of it cost the equivalent of $25,000 today. And subsequently is why the color purple and the phoenix is associated with royalty. Because only nobles and royalty could afford the costly purple dye in those ancient days. It's pretty much the same today. I don't know many people who could afford to pay $25,000 for 12 ounces of anything. Except maybe for some good Mary Jane. But that's a different story. Here's more on the phoenix. The phoenix is a mythical, sacred firebird that can be found in the mythologies of the Persians, Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Chinese, and Japanese. It is a fire spirit, with a colorful plumage and a tail of gold and scarlet. Some legends indicate a tail of purple, blue, and green. This fabulous bird was associated with the worship of the sun and the Egyptian sun god Ra. Only one phoenix existed at any time, and it was very long-lived. In its twilight hour, the phoenix fashioned a nest of aromatic bows and spices. Then it set fire to the nest and was consumed in the flames. 
a new phoenix miraculously sprang from the pyre. Then, after embalming its father's ashes in an egg of myrrh, it flew to the city of the sun Heliopolis in Egypt, where it deposited the ashes onto the altar in the temple of the Egyptian sun god Ra. The Greek historian Herodotus is credited with introducing the legend of the phoenix into Western culture after his travels in Egypt. In his masterpiece, The Histories, in the 5th century BCE, Herodotus tells of many new fantastic beasts, including the crocodile, the hippopotamus, and the phoenix. In later antiquity, the phoenix was compared to the undying Rome, and it appears on the coinage of the late Roman Empire as the symbol of the eternal city. It was also widely interpreted as an allegory of resurrection and life after death. As far as history can show, the oldest version of the phoenix can be found in the Egyptian Bennu bird, which archaeologists have linked to a now extinct species of heron. The Egyptians believed that the universe began with the cry of this bird, and, due to their culture's fixation on immortality, came to hold this long-lived bird in high regard. However, the Arabic phoenix is the most popular version in modern times, and is almost instantly recognizable as the most frequent depiction of the phoenix. It is derived from the Egyptian phoenix, and has hardly changed much at all. Ancient Greece describes the Nimbus, a large purple bird with a fiery crest, and further east we find the Chinese Feng Huang, with the various depictions of this bird claiming that it fed on dewdrops and was almost weightless. The Japanese version deviates from the more western myths by having the phoenix occur in pairs, the male Ho-Oh and the female Ho-U, which were said to bring gifts and good fortune to the people of the world. With all of these depictions, it is strange to discover that one specific origin for all these variations is lacking. One would think that mutated stories of a single creature might birth this myth in a similar manner to the unicorn. However, there appears to be no real-world analogue. Indeed, the association of such a specific animal, a bird, with the sun, while logical, is nevertheless difficult to explain how such a specific proliferation may come about. Perhaps the extinct heron species upon which the Benu bird may be based was quite a far-ranged animal, occurring in many parts of the world. Considering that this Benu bird went extinct around 5000 BC, this hypothesis may hold some truth, as this is more than enough time for something real to pass into myth. Passing into myth, as so much of our history and cultures often do. As stated before, the definition of the word myth is speech, story, or anything spread by word of mouth. Now let's take the definition of the word history. Its obsolete definition is tale or story, which story is in the actual word. However, its etymology or root definition comes from the Greek historiae, which means learning or knowing by inquiry, narrative, or story. This in turn comes from histor, knowing or learned wise man, which is why it was called his story, the story of the learned wise man. From these two definitions, we can clearly see that myth and history are synonymous, both being stories told by word of mouth. However, myths are thought of something that may or may not be true, while history is taken to be the absolute truth in most cases. So depending on where the story came from, it was taken as either myth or history. This brings us to the ancient and recent forgotten history of melanated or so-called black people, which has fallen into myth because of a lack of knowledge by our people and an apathy to find out. Better known as the basic, what the fuck that got to do with me today attitude. But your history has everything to do with you today because if you don't know who you were, you can't know who you are. Let's take the word black. In language, there's something called connotation and denotation. The connotation of a word is the accepted or made up meaning that goes along with the actual meaning or denotation of the word. You can think of connotation as a con artist basically someone or something that lies and tricks you into thinking the fake thing is real. Donald Trump. The connotation of the word black or accepted con artist meaning is dark. However, the etymology or actual meaning of the word comes from the word bleak or blake, which means pale or yellow. The word for dark up until the 16th century or 1500s was swart or swarthy, used by Caucasians to describe dark skinned people. However, the word we use to describe ourselves and the universal term for dark-skinned people was Moor. So what is and who were the Moors? I know you know where they are, so tell me. Before I do some damage, you won't walk away from. Could I uh, <clears throat> have one of those Chesterfields now? Sure. You 
got a match. Oh, wait, no, no, I got, don't bother, I got one. You're Sicilian, huh? Sicilian. <laughs> you know, I read a lot, especially about things, about history. I find that shit fascinating. Here's a fact, I don't know whether you know or not. Well, Sicilians were spawned by niggas. Come again? <laughs> no, it, it, it's a fact, yeah. You see, uh, Sicilians have uh, black blood pumping through their hearts. And, and no, if you, if, you, if you don't believe me, uh, you can look it up. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, uh, you see, um, the Moors conquered Sicily. And the Moors are niggers. Yeah. See, you see, way back then, uh, Sicilians were like uh, wops from northern Italy. Uh, they all had blonde hair and blue eyes. But, uh, well, then the Moors moved in there and, uh, well, they changed the whole country. They did so much fucking with Sicilian women, huh? that they changed the whole bloodline forever. That's why blonde hair and blue eyes became black hair and dark skin. You know, it's absolutely amazing to me to think that to this day, hundreds of years later, that, uh, that Sicilians still carry that nigga gene. Now this, <laughs> no, I'm, no, I'm quoting history. It's written. It's a fact. It's written. I love this guy. I love no. this guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Your ancestors are niggers. Uh -huh. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. And and your great 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 grandmother fucked a nigger. Oh, yeah. And she had a half nigger kid. Now, if that's a fact, tell me, am I lying? Because you, you're part eggplant. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. You're a cantaloupe. <laughs> if you look up the definition in the Oxford Dictionary, you will see that Moore is defined as a native of Mauritania, later of Northwest Africa like Morocco, compared with Blackamoor. Keep going, and it says Mohammedan, especially from India. That's from the 16th century or the 1500s. If you keep going back to the Middle English, the word is spelled M-O-R-E, and that's taken from the Old French, which is spelled M-O-R-E, a word that we use a hundred times a day, and we have no idea where it comes from. Eventually, we get all the way back to the Greek moros, which means dark or burnt, which goes to why the land is called Mauritania, the dark land or land of dark people. The word Mor originally comes from the ancient words for Africa, Moro and Tamor, among a few others, meaning the dark land, just as the ancient name of Egypt is actually Kemet, which also means the dark land, called so because of the rich fertile soil that surrounded the area in those times, produced by the flowing waters of the Nile, which is also why dark marsh or swamp land is called Moorland or the Moors, as in the Disney character Maleficent, Queen of the Moors. Now let's break down this character Maleficent for a second. The etymology of Maleficent means to do ill. The word ill does not mean sick like most of you think. However, it means to do evil or to be wicked. 
Now this is where it gets dope. Evil only means to be uppity, or a more familiar term for most of you would be stuck up or bougie. Now the word wicked goes back to wicca, which means male wizard. And wizard just means wise man or philosopher, or someone who loves and uses knowledge. In ancient times, as in many places today, it was customary for the uneducated or unlearned to look upon those who had knowledge and information as being stuck up, bougie, or hence evil. Also, another definition for the word moor is to tie off a ship to boat or land. This definition ultimately goes back to the aforementioned Phoenician Empire, which was the greatest maritime naval empire in history and the very first to map the seas of the world. So, who really were these people called Phoenicians? The ancient Phoenicians were Moors, or a majority of highly melanated or dark-skinned people and a mixture of some less melanated people whose empire spans from about 1500 BC to 300 BC. This former world superpower's origin began in ancient Canaan, or what is now known today as Lebanon. As stated, they were the greatest maritime nation in history and mapped the seas of the world. They created the first alphabet, or a way to use symbols and tones to communicate. Something known today as phonetics, being that it comes from the Phoenicians. It's also where you get the word telephone, a device used to communicate, from telephasa or teleph, wife to the king of Phoenicia, or phone Isha. The Phoenicians also created city-states, also known as nation-states, or every modern republic government in the world today. They also established many colonies throughout the Mediterranean, such as Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Carthage, which is modern-day Tunisia, Libya, Sardinia, Sicily, Malta, and many more with all of these colonies being run as city-states or sovereign autonomous governments long before the so-called establishment of the Roman Republic. These colonies would eventually be re-established as nations or countries by later Moorish Ottoman empires. The Canaanite Phoenicians were like the FedEx of the ancient world. They transported the trade goods of every city or nation in the Mediterranean and beyond, especially their own goods, as well as those so-called Cometans, also known as Egyptians. They were the masters of navigation and astronomy, so much so that the North Star was called the Phoenician Star just up until the early 1900s. They were skilled diplomats and politicians and had alliances with every city or nation in the Mediterranean, even those at war with each other because of their ability to transport goods on the sea. But even more than this, they were masters of knowledge, drawing upon the initiated mystery school physical and spiritual sciences passed down and shared from the ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, and Egyptians, such as astronomy, navigation of the stars, chemistry, mathematics, geometry, astrology, medicine, philosophy, architecture, agriculture, the manipulation of energy and vibration, which most of us know as physics, even theater, all started in the ancient melanated civilizations of Sumer, Kemet, and Phoenicia. But it is to this very civilization the ancient Canaanite Phoenician Moors, a majority of highly intelligent, spiritual sun-kissed people that we owe most of our first myths and legends of the Phoenix to, as well as to the history of melanated empires around the world rising, lasting for a period of 500 to 1500 years, then falling, only to be reborn again. In Greek mythology, Phoenicia, a name created by the Greeks, comes from a man named, what else? Phoenix the son of the king of Tyre, the capital city of Phoenicia. Not only that, in the Iliad, which is written by Homer, and what most scholars take is based on actual history, Europa, which is where Europe gets its very name, is the daughter of Phoenix. So she too is a Phoenician Canaanite and the entire continent of Europe named after her. In fact, in order to be considered royalty in Europe, you have to be descended from the Canaanite Phoenician Moors or the Moors bloodline in general. No exceptions. See Nature Knows No Color Lines by J.A. Rogers. So as we can see, the Phoenicians were a highly advanced maritime trading empire whose use of esoteric knowledge, trade, and diplomacy made them one of, if not the greatest civilization in the ancient world. The Phoenicians used their knowledge to help grow and advance the world, creating relationships and alliances with diverse cultures and governments to help facilitate trade and the sharing of information. It is no wonder that this benevolent and magnificent bird called the Phoenix 
is attributed with such magical and mythical powers, being that its symbolic origin can be traced all the way back to this glorious empire of noble Canaanite Phoenician Moors, or who we more powerfully call Phoenix Moors, the Dragon Moor. Now, as we have shown, the word dragon means clear sight or eye. This definition or meaning goes back to ancient Kemet, also known as Egypt, where they used a serpent or crocodile to represent a certain gland within the body called the pineal gland. Most knowledge about this little pine cone shaped gland sitting deep within the center of your brain is hidden today. However, in most civilizations throughout history, it was regarded as the most important organ in the body. The temple was more than a place of worship as we understand it today. The temple was the teaching. It was a three-dimensional lesson, a non-linear book. The temple spoke in symbol, volume, harmony, proportion, scale, and indeed in time. The temple is a puzzle. The job, the joy of the initiate, is to solve its nested and concentric riddles. In many cases, a mystery once solved reveals a deeper enigma beneath. Schwaller's landmark work at Luxor, the result of 17 years on site, returned to the modern world a window into the sacred science of the ancients. A careful study of the temple's measurements revealed an altogether unexpected finding. This strange temple, which Schwaller would come to call the Temple of Man, was laid out according to the proportions of an idealized male frame. But the temple did not just reflect the patterns of the physical body. The architecture and the reliefs in the temple reveal the occult or metaphysical anatomy of man. It was a masterpiece of symbolist teaching and perhaps a massive instrument of magical correspondence. The temple was a repository of the great arcanum of the anthropocosm. The man cosmos. As above, so below. Man is made in the image of God. Man is not only the culminant creation of the universe, but in fact man is the universe. It's here, of course, that Schwaller, that Schwaller developed his whole doctrine that he called the Anthropocosm, which is the, the man cosmos, because written into us, support Platonic philosophy as well, Plato's sign over his gymnasium was, was a man know thyself. The idea being that if, if you really know everything there is to know about yourself, you understand everything that there is to know about the cosmos. The hermetic thing, as above, so below. In us are written all of the laws of the universe. This particular one, which is proportioned exactly to the, to the proportions of the, of the idealized male skeleton, male figure, um, contains or embodies all of, the, all of the laws pertaining to humanity and our role within the scheme. In revealing the great arcanum of the Anthropocosmos, the Temple of Luxor demonstrates the invisible principles which interact to create and perpetuate both conscious man and the conscious universe through the interplay of the physical, mental, spiritual, and archetypal realms. It showed the hologrammatic relationship between microcosm and macrocosm, between us and the conscious universe. A complex system of correspondences seems at every juncture to reveal and revivify another link with the ageless wisdom and occult teachings from the oldest cultures around the world. The entrance to the temple is through the front pylon. Every detail, 
Every architectural feature is a symbolic component or lesson in the sacred sciences. The symbolic architecture of the classic pylon is a treasure of occult correspondences. It is said to represent the horizon, the division of unity into duality. The symbol evokes the image of an interworking of hemispheres which brings the dawn of intelligence symbolized as the illumination of the rising sun. An example from Hermeticism shows in pictorial form another aspect of the Arcanum represented by this symbolic architecture. Here we see a visual metaphor of the Divine Child born of a union of sun and moon at the pineal or third eye. The two caves represent not only the physical hemispheres but the archetypal vesica pisces of human intelligence, the duality and the unity that is intelligence. This deep arcane finds parallel in both the mental realm and the physical realm. The central location of the entrance to the temple corresponds physically and symbolically to the central pineal gland. As we enter and leave each new life and new body through the third eye, so too do we enter and leave the temple through this midpoint between the hemispheres. This hall corresponds to the eyes and optical center, where the nerves cross, and the right brain receives what the left eye sees, and the left brain receives what the right eye sees. The hall is dominated by 12 columns, this is known as the Hall of Twelve Columns, which represents symbolically the twelve hours of day and twelve hours of night. It's interesting to note that the optic nerve consists of twelve bundles of nerves. This is the center of vision as it relates to consciousness. Above the optical center of the temple, in what would correspond to the higher glands of the brain, we find a set of three interlocking sanctuaries. The solid stone walls between the three chambers hold one of the most amazing surprises to be found in Luxor. The expansive imagery carved into each side of separating walls can only be understood by combining the images carved on the other side of the same wall. The images interlock, enhance, and complete each other. It is as if a single image or idea was etched partially on one side of a thick sheet of glass and partially on the opposite side. The wall itself connects and synthesizes them. It is as if the walls depict a sacred thought being transmitted through the brain. This triple sanctuary is home to the pineal gland, or third eye. The enigmatic cobra rising from the third eye of the pharaoh is so prevalent that it is almost synonymous with Egyptian art. What did it mean? The central aspect of the pharaohs was that they were humankind perfected and elevated to a divine plane. The cobra over the pineal gland area served as the perfect insignia for their status, but also connects to a concept found in countless cultures. It echoes and amplifies the similar concepts at the heart of Hindu and Asian sacred teachings. The transformation into a higher spiritual manifestation is symbolized by the Hindus as a kundalini snake. It represents life energy redirected and refined for the creation of a higher spiritual presence. Similarly, Throughout tantric, alchemical, and modern magical disciplines, it is an indicator of the universal pursuit of higher consciousness. A curious note concerning the Uraeus serpent, the, the cobra that appears over the forehead of, uh, of the pharaoh's headpiece and such. Uh, while obviously uh, a symbol of the activation of the Ajna chakra, the third eye chakra, in uh, the psychic system of, of mankind. It also points to a secret form of worship open only to initiates. So while, while the, 
the populace, while the masses worshipped the bull of Taurus, and this was during the astrological age of Taurus, uh, well, they publicly worshipped the bull, the priests, the kings, secretly worshipped the snake of Scorpio, which is on the opposite pole, directly opposite in the zodiac from Taurus. This ancient and secret science, called Kundalini in some cultures, is universally represented by and symbolically associated with the snake. This arcane and magical science seems to have occupied a position of great importance in the minds of the Egyptian elite. In every culture, the symbolism of the snake is deeply rooted in magic, in forbidden knowledge, and in the pursuit of higher states of consciousness. In this relief from the tomb of Seti III, we see not only the snake symbolism, but we see the rising sun, itself a symbol of the dawn of a higher consciousness, cresting two intertwined serpents. What makes this relief even more interesting is when we overlay the same template provided by Luxor Temple, the symbolism of this relief becomes clear. We see so many correlations, it seems incontrovertible that these two images are linked in some way. This ancient and secret science, symbolized by the snake and associated with rising light and higher consciousness, seems to have been of central importance to the magical operations employed to gain mastery over the transition into the afterlife. In nearly every ancient culture which placed a value on the pursuit of higher states of consciousness, the symbolic use of the snake to represent various channels and forces of higher, subtle or spiritual energy is a universal tradition. The location of the rising cobra at the exact site of the third eye reinforces the special emphasis placed on this same site by the pylons and connects this symbolism to the rich heritage and pound cultural associations it carries. Near the center of the brain, we find a tiny pine cone shaped gland, which may be one of the most wondrous parts of our physical body. We know that the pineal gland produces serotonin and melatonin, neurotransmitters which regulate waking and sleeping cycles, as well as playing a crucial role in mood. But it may also be true that the pineal produces DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, a neurotransmitter which creates a natural psychedelic state of consciousness. If so, then this little gland plays not only a crucial role in our psychological well-being, but it may hold the key for unlocking the true potential of humanity. In this gland, there is floating water, a reservoir of water, with crystals that actually have piezoelectric properties. There's also another thing called piezoluminescence. If you have a little lighter, and you hit the lighter, and then you get that little spark that comes out, that's from a crystal being compressed. And as the crystal is compressed, it releases photons. In your brain, you have these little floating crystals that actually have that quality. And even better than that is there is another characteristic called piezochromism. Piezochromatic crystals are crystals that can release any color of light in the rainbow. Dimethyltryptamine is the main chemical that seems to do this. When DMT is chipped out of a tray that it was synthesized in, you hit it with a screwdriver, bam, you get these big bursts of colored light. Big burst of red, big burst of green, big burst of yellow, big burst of blue. Well, you have these little crystals floating in your brain. DMT is this, you know, dimethyltryptamine. It's what they, the theory is that it's what's released by the pineal gland that gives us these elevated states of insight. Maybe DMT is the lens of our pineal gland, uh, allowing us to see wider areas of reality than are normally accessible to our senses. Many ancient esoteric traditions and mystical schools knew of the potential of the pineal. The ancient Greeks believed it to be our connection to the realms of thought. Buddhists know it as a symbol of spiritual awakening. In Hinduism, the pineal connects with the third eye chakra, 
the seat of intuition and clairvoyance. Jesus proclaimed that the eye is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. If Rene Descartes is right, and the pineal gland is indeed the seat of the human soul, then these traditions are correct in believing that it serves as the connecting link between the physical and spiritual worlds. How did they know about the third eye? Because the, each chakra connects in to an organ. So what fascinates me is the sixth chakra plugs into the pineal gland. The pineal gland has photoreceptors on it. And yet they knew that thousands of years ago before they ever knew that there were photoreceptors on the pineal. So that to me, it shows you that we know a lot more in the past than we even do now with our technology. The pineal gland is lined on the inside with tissue called pinealocytes. These pinealocytes are similar to the rods and cones in the retina of your eye. That's right, it's the third eye. Your brain has a third eye in the center and it has retinal tissue. It also has the same wiring as your physical eyes do to the visual cortex in your brain. How did they know that all the way back then? That would imply very advanced technology that would have been required for them to gain such incredible information about the brain. And yet they did. And so think about what that means.